The snow-capped mountain range stands tall while the haying lands are all around you as you enter the Fort Hall Indian Reservation located on the Snake River Plains about 20 miles northwest of the city of Pocatello, Idaho. The Shoshones and Bamots entered into peace treaties in 1863 and 1868, known today as the Fort Bridger Treaties. The Fort Hall Reservation was reserved by the tribes under the 1868 Treaty Agreement and is named for the Fort Hall Trading Post in the Snake River Bottoms. It was established by European Americans. The Bottoms' cultural history extends for millennia. In ancient wintering grounds next to the Snake River, the Bottoms extends between the Portneuf River on the south and the Blackfoot River on the north, known for ice-free spring-fed creeks and abundant plant, fish, and animal life. Later, and only a relatively short-lived period in the long Shoshone and Bannock history of the Bottoms, Fort Hall became an important stop along the Oregon and California trails in the mid-19th century. The Shoshone Bannock tribes of Fort Hall are comprised of the bands of the Northern Shoshone and the Bannock, or Northern Paiute bands. Ancestral lands of both tribes occupied vast regions of land encompassing present-day Idaho, Oregon, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, and into Canada. When the Northern Paiutes left the Nevada and Utah regions for Southern Idaho in the 1600s, they began to travel with the Shoshones in pursuit of buffalo. They became known as the Bannocks. Initially completed in 1977, the soil survey of the Fort Hall Indian Reservation in Idaho needed an update to improve the survey data required for conservation planning efforts on the reservation and to address the Natural Resources Conservation Service's priority of ensuring equality in the delivery and implementation of all programs and services. The soil survey updates began in 2020 and involved soil scientists digging soil pits around the reservation, taking samples and analyzing them from areas needed for grazing, hay production, and a fishery used by the Shoshone and Bamak tribes. In 2023, the new data was input into the NRCS Web Soil Survey website, where the public can freely access it today. Approximately 24,325 acres have been updated to accurately reflect water tables, varying textures, the presence of organic soils, and saline alkali properties. Forage production was also updated to help manage grazing needs. NRCS Soil and Plant Science Division soil scientists developed relationships with tribal members, creating future opportunities for technical soil services while successfully working with the Historical Preservation Committee, Cultural Resource Committee, and Language Specialists for the Shoshone Bannock Tribes to name six new soil series. What does the new soil series look like and what makes the different soils unique? And how did the tribes choose the names they gave them? And what is the significance of those names? Let's take a look and listen. Hi, I'm Nolan Brown. I am the Original Territories Historical Research Manager at the Language and Cultural Preservation Department, Shoshone Bannock Tribes. I am Shoshone Bannock and I'm also Anishinaabe. We are on the Fort Hall Indian Reservation, it's called. And here is where our various Shoshone and Bannock people, bands, were either already home to this area or that they were removed and forcefully pushed onto the reservation from different areas. So a lot of our role in Original Territories Historical Research Office is to research these different homelands that we were removed from, document them. Our reservation is over half a million acres and our tribes own 98% of it, either in individual allotment or in, held in trust by the whole tribe. So. That's unique among uh, Indian country that we own such a large percentage of our reservation still. There's a lot of reservations that are checkerboarded and um, have, have that type of land status. Here with our lands, the tribal members generally lease and then the large potato growing operations uh, and others have been farming those lands. Agriculture has been going on here in Fort Hall, you know, for over a hundred years now. There are tribal members who, who do do things like cut hay. We have a tribal agricultural enterprise, which we've done organic farming and other farming, as well as our bison herd is underneath our tribal agriculture business. So we have a, a herd of about 400 
bison, uh, nuukuch we call them. With that updated soil survey in 2020, we were able to identify an additional features that would support the existence of a new soil series. And so a soil series is a soils that have certain properties that are similar that we can put in a box or create create a series because those interpretations will be the same and those interpretations are important for the tribe as they manage their land for the potential or limitations depending on their management. Currently there's over 20,000 soil series in the United States and so these properties that exist in each of these soil series they do not exist in current soil series and so because they can't fit in a box of an existing soil series, we create a new soil series. So finding, finding a new soil series is really not unique. It's just something we do every day as we map soils. It's, and so we find new soils all the time. And they'll have a taxonomic name, just like plants. And sometimes it's, it's, it's a little difficult for everyone to remember some of those Latin-based terms with a taxonomic name. So we give them a nickname or a series name and so these are the series names that we've come up with with the assistance of the tribe. We wanted to help and we wanted to use our language um, because that's our role we want to use our language as much as possible and and teach and make sure that it's uh, growing and thriving. We worked with our language instructors our language program and we sat and discussed this over a period of a few months and kind of kicked out some ideas and then uh, we we revisited it a couple months later Bryce came and we just sat there for at least a couple hours until we had chosen these names so the first one is after Isaac Sandy and Isaac Sandy I believe is the grandfather of our lead language instructor Zelfia Towersap She's in her 90s, um, so Isaac Sandy was, you know, one of the, the early Bannocks who came here to Fort Hall. Some of these characteristics that are found in the Ice Sandy series are not found in other soil series. And so we were looking at the, the profile has 25 to 65 percent rock fragments and 3 to 8 percent clay. And, and if there was another series out there that was close or the limitations or the the potential of the soil, we would have used that series. We would have correlated this soil to that series. But because we couldn't find anything that fit this taxonomic name, then we created this new series. So these properties can be better used for, for use and management. The sand's really important for the fort hall for potato production. We're looking at just a low percentage of clay in this soil and a lot of sand. And as we move deeper into the profile, we pick up a, a coarser sand. The sand on top of here is a different source than the sand on bottom, but it still comes out sandy. So, so there's not a lot of sandy soils described in, in the mollic. And mollic, when we get to soil taxonomy, the mollusols are, are deep, dark colors on the surface, and they've got some organic matter. And so even though we've got a lot of sand, we've got a lot of organic matter in these sands. And so it, it's kind of rare to see a sandy soil with this much organic matter in it. So that's why we get limited on our series pretty quick with what's available. So that's why we created this one here. So this soil we named Depi Basiwa Deep. In the Bannock language, it just simply means uh, rocky sand soil. So when I was out here looking at this soil, I keyed in on the gopher activity that was going on because it'll sometimes tell you what's underneath the surface. They'll bring up a lot of the carbonates that could be underneath there, some of the rocks that you don't see on the surface that could be under there. And so I knew I had something different here. I still had that sandy, that sandy surface texture that we had from the last site, but some things have changed. So after digging a couple of holes into, the, into this area, we found the water was missing and we now had rocks. So basically we've, we've just replaced the water with the rocks here and we ended up with this rocky sand soil. The third new soil we identified was uh, down here at, at the base of Ferry Butte, Basa Deep in Bannock language. It means um, dry soil, dry earth. So 
So you see a bunch of the, the wider surface here. That's the carbonates creating that calcid material. And then we also have a contrasting particle size class. So we've got some, a different structure or different texture up here on top versus what's on the bottom. And so we've got two different events that created the soil. More than likely we have some lust material over some alluvial material that's influenced this, creating a new soil series for the tribe. All right, so here we're still up on top of um, Bohogoy, Ferry Butte, and across the, the floodplain here, we see um, this hill, which we call Hunamuza, um, or uh, Bitter, Bitterbrush Point. And so this soil we call uh, Dosa Nuku, and I'll talk a little bit about it, Bryce. Yeah, so this is where we've got some basalt coming on our terrace. So our terrace is flat coming across the valley bottom. And then as that basalt comes down, it's created that hill. And where that intersects is where this soil occurs. So we're moderately deep to bedrock, just up off the, the terrace. And that's why we're getting these calcium carbonates that are forming just above the bedrock because they can't precipitate any further into the profile. This comes out of durizerols, meaning there's some silica cementation going on in the bottom. And then there's a little bit of a silica cap that's forming and plugging the pores on top of the rock, the lithic material, the bedrock that's found underneath the soil. It gives it a unique feature, that, which is helping to create that white covering that the tribe used to identify the soil. So in our language, um this is what's called uh, chalk in Shoshone, it's Avery. But to describe it, what, what they see is they see a, a white cover. So the, in Shoshone, it's dosa nukuna. We are here near my family home. This is the location of Nosun's family home, where my great-grandfather Nosun lived, where uh, he had his, his children. My great-grandmother Ann Hope gave birth to my grandmother just a little bit further down underneath those other set of trees in the traditional manner in what's called a moon house. We named soil series uh, number five after my great-grandfather no son. So if you was a small child you'd be almost feel like standing in a sandbox right now. It's so sandy right here. But you wouldn't think that it was wet because sandy soils are very well-drained soils. So when we dug a profile here and we ended up with water in the profile, it was kind of got us thinking maybe something else is going on here. And then if you look around your surroundings, you see a, a willow stand just off over here. And then also now that the sand has had some time to dry out, you see some iron concentrations coming in to represent itself, which is an indicator of a wet soil. So we've got that lower in the profile. Together with our language and cultural preservation department language instructors, we sat down and we looked at the map and we looked at the soil sample and we, we had discussion about different names for it. One was the, the Tsina Han Sogop, which means potatoes dirt because all of this land is you know known for growing um, our Idaho potatoes. But when we decided to name some of the soils in honor of our ancestors, we had chosen my great-grandfather, uh, No Son, as, as the name for the soil. So No Son was the individual who was released from prisoner of war camp with his, with his three grandmothers and uh, traveled to Fort Hall with them. And, and they kept him alive because his, his mother died um, while at, in the POW camps. So this is a very unique soil because it's very rare that we get wet sands and that's what we have here. And so for some reason water is subbing up into this part of the of the landform and it's good for I think they have alfalfa on this when we mapped it and there maybe been some corn too on, on part of this map unit here. 
We're standing up here on what we call in Shoshone, Bohogoe, or Fairy Butte. It's a prominent feature here um, at the head of what we call the Fort Hall Snake River Bottoms. And in our language, we, in Shoshone, we say Banguagat, and that means next to the water. And this area has always been significant to us as a winter campgrounds. And in the past, those campgrounds would extend here all the way down to the confluence with the Portneuf River. So miles and miles of, of campsites that our people had enjoyed. And the formation here is, is volcanic and out at the base of here are where all of the springs come out. Spring Creek emerges here and it's one of the largest uh, creeks that we have and it merges with the, with the Snake River further downstream. The soil number six is Barape Kua'aka and that's the soil that holds water. This soil is, is uh, really important to the tribe in the bottoms as it's important for the fisheries and the, and the buffalo. It's along the floodplains and the material here is uh, fine silty, but we've got some really, really deep organic material. So that's where this, this soil comes into play for the tribe. Well, having these was extremely helpful, having the soil samples. We can, you know, observe and look at their qualities. And um, we also looked at the locations of where they were. And then we considered also what was going on on the landscape, so. It was a lot of fun sitting around the table with these folks, trying to pronounce them. Even Nolan was pronouncing them in Shoshone, and some of the folks felt maybe they should be pronounced in, in Banach. And historical books were even looked at to make sure the pronunciation was right. It, it meant a lot to the tribe to make sure that it was done right, and it was carefully done and, and sought out. The field offices will have that information available to them for helping the tribe design programs that they will, they will assist or help with some of the farming and agricultural practices in partnership with the tribe. Typically, we don't work with the language specialist. We work with the, the land managers. And so this was a great opportunity for us to get to know Nolan and his crew and his department and what they do. And he really did help us out. You know, a phrase that our elders and others in, in our tribal leadership has have stated is we are the land and the land is us. And going back into the research on treaty negotiations, it was a biting bear of the Bruno who described, you know, who our people are. He said, the bones of my ancestors are buried in the cliffs and the crevices here, and this is our home, and I want to be buried here too. And when you look back at a lot of Native peoples, they say, um, you, you're not really home until you're, the soil is, is made up of the dust of your ancestors. So that's how important our land is to us, you know, that we've been here for so long that, you know, we feel that we are, we are the land, we are part of it. So this opportunity to name the soils in honor of, of our people using our languages is, is, is significant.